what wouldn't my father have given to have been here this evening? He would have been thrilled. I think thrilled really is the word to see so many friends, colleagues, familiar faces. Welcome, those of you who just walked in. And of course, family members, family members especially, he would have been very, very pleased. Four of his five children are here tonight. I see his half-brother sitting there in the second row. At least one of his nieces, maybe two. One. Um, his adored wife, front and center. One son-in-law. You get the idea. In any case, my father is certainly here in spirit. Not long before he died last March, he saw a mock-up of the book's cover designed by the talented David Drumgold. He wasn't doing well then, but just seeing the cover really put a smile on his face. He was thrilled. My father, as Doris suggested, spent years talking about this book, to the point, quite honestly, I think most of us and his family just got to the stage where we were rolling our eyes. And that was well before there was an English translation. Eventually, he convinced me to take on the task of having the book published. Clearly, Doris had a role that I didn't know about in that. But even before then, he had roped in his good friend Alan Gottlieb, for one, who was also here this evening, and the late George Jonas, for another, in an effort to get this book published. Over and over, like the great salesman he was, he insisted that this book needed to be published and quickly. Of course, it ended up taking years and years. And while my father set the wheels in motion, many, many others made it possible for this book to exist. Doris Bergen, most notably, was one of the earliest champions. And she was critical to the project, as were others at the Ann Tannenbaum Department of Jewish Studies. Here this evening um, are at least two people from McGill Queens University Press, including our marvelous editor, Richard Ratzlaff. They not only agreed to publish the book at long last, but they published it beautifully, as those of you who have held it in your hands can attest. The cartographer, Michael Fisher, I think he's out here somewhere. There he is. Uh, designed the book's fantastic maps and was gracious enough to fly in from Calgary to attend this evening's events. Rebecca Carter Chand, I hope she's here too. She came in from Washington. She wrote our index, and those of you who like indices as much as I do will appreciate what a fantastic job she did. Susan Papp, Doris already mentioned her in the second row, wrote the biographical essay about Ernu Munkachi, and she had to dig deeply into the archives for that, the archives both in Budapest and in Washington, and she pulled up material that none of us had known about before. For all that, three people who were most central to this book are not here tonight. Our terrific translator, Peter Lengel in Budapest, and most vitally, the scholars, Ferenc Laszlo, who wrote the introduction, and Lajlo Chush, who wrote the annotations, both of them practically served as my co-editors. Like my father, they are here tonight in spirit. And without further delay, I'm going to read my preface this evening, with apologies in advance to those of you who got the book early and have already read it. A few years ago, while rummaging through his desk drawers, my father, Peter Monk, found a tattered copy of a Hungarian book written in 1947 by his cousin, Ernu Munkachi. My father sat down, read the book in one sitting, and called me. This book, he began urgently, it has to be published in English. Leading scholars of the, Holoc of the Holocaust in Hungary have long been influenced by Ernu Munkachi's remarkable book of 1947. Notably, how it happened served as a vital source for Randolph Braham's encyclopedic, The Politics of Genocide. But as my father understood immediately, how it happened is not only an important historical record of the Holocaust in Hungary, it's an extraordinary first-hand account of the atrocity written by a privileged 
eyewitness and victim, memoirs of war are always affected by hindsight bias. How it happened was written right after the Second World War, when the wounds were still raw. That immediacy magnifies the horrors that Moncachi describes. The barrage of increasingly preposterous demands made by Adolf Eichmann's Special Operations Unit in Budapest, the Sondereinsatzkommando Eichmann, the complicity of the Hungarian authorities, the disagreements that unfolded behind closed doors among the frantic members of the Hungarian Judenrat, the mind-numbing swiftness and barbarity with which hundreds of thousands of Hungary's Jews were rounded up, robbed of their property and civil rights, herded into ghettos, and murdered in Nazi concentration camps. My father and Ernu Moncachi were first cousins once removed. My father's grandfather was Moncachi's uncle. I think I have that right. The Monk family was big and tightly knit and comfortably bourgeois. In Budapest, in the years leading up to the war, family members gathered frequently at their local coffee house. Orzhag has cafe has. My Hungarian is terrible, I'm sorry. They gathered at their synagogue on what was then Shaki Street and for Shabbat dinners at my great-grandfather Gabor Monk's well-appointed apartment in Lipot Vados. Ernu, born in 1896, was 31 years older than my father. My father, born in 1927, remembered his older cousin as serious, dutiful, and, this is a direct quote, rather dull. By all accounts, Ernu was all that, and more. He was a member of Budapest Jewish intelligentsia, a highly respected jurist, cultured and committed to doing right by his community. As Susan Papp argues in her biographical essay, by acting as secretary for the Judenrat, or the Jewish Council, Erno Munkachi surely believed that he could act as a bulwark against the Nazis. The reality was something very different as revealed by a disquieting joke that Ernu recounts in How It Happened. A Jew is awoken in the middle of the night by a banging on his door. Who's there? He calls out. The Gestapo, comes the answer. Thank God, says the Jew with obvious relief. I thought it was the Jewish council. <laughs> to read How It Happened is to understand that the Budapest-based Junrat an administrative body established by the SS immediately after the invasion of Hungary in March 1944, inadvertently facilitated the Nazis' wholesale extermination of Hungarian Jews. Those are Ernu's words, the wholesale extermination of Hungarian Jews. Even today, this is a deeply unsettling and controversial topic. The tragic role played by the Jewish councils, not only in Hungary, in Poland, in other Nazi-occupied nations, is often defined in terms of impossible choices, or, to quote the Holocaust scholar Lawrence Langer, choiceless choices. In the politics of genocide, Braham describes the Hungarian Judenrat as naive, ineffective, and almost completely oblivious of the inferno around it. Rudolf Verba, an SKP, whose detailed report of April 1944 first documented the extent of the horrors at Auschwitz, went further in his critique of the Jewish elite who composed the Judenrat, charging them in his later memoirs with complicity in the Nazi crimes. Quote, it is my contention that a small group of informed people, by their silence, deprived others of the possibility or privilege of making their own decisions in the face of mortal dangers. Ernu Moncachi wrote how it happened long before Braham or Verba questioned the role of Jewish leaders in Hungary. 
Yet already, in the immediate aftermath of the war, he and other members of the Judenrat were confronted with intense hostility and outrage from fellow survivors, many of whom had lost their whole family and communities to the gas chambers. Why didn't the Judenrat do more to save people? How did the Judenrat and their families manage to emerge largely unscathed from the war, even while more than 400,000 Hungarian Jews were murdered? In his perceptive introduction to this book, Ferenc Lazzo suggests that in writing how it happened, Ernu had a personal stake in denying how much he knew about the Holocaust by mid-1944. He needed to defend himself against accusations of having done too little too late. Philip Freudiger was another member of my family who served on the Hungarian Judenrat in 1944. Years later, as a witness at the Eichmann trial, Freudiger was asked, what he did to prevent the mass deportations in Hungary. What could we have done, he answered. Erno Munkachi and Philip Freudiger weren't the only members of my family who wrestled with their wartime records. In June 1944, as the cattle cars rolled from Hungary to the Auschwitz-Birkenau death camp at peak capacity, 14 members of my immediate family, including my father, grandfather, and great-grandfather, fled Budapest on what we now know as the Kostner train, the result of secret negotiations between the Nazis that permitted 1,687 select Jews to flee to safety in Switzerland. To be blunt, my family used its connections and its money to escape the inferno, while others with less money and fewer connections were murdered. That unspoken, unsavory fact has caused lingering rifts, even within my own family. Because less wealthy or less lucky branches of the family were trapped in Hungary and slaughtered by the Nazis or the Arrow Cross fascists. What was the right thing to do during the Holocaust? In How It Happened, Munkachi offers readers a new understanding of the lamentable, impossible balancing act that he and his fellow members of the Judenrat performed. They were not heroes. They were dutiful, rather dull, members of the establishment who implicitly or conveniently trusted in the established order that had permitted them to thrive in Hungary. Even as increasingly severe anti-Jewish measures robbed them of their property, their jobs, their civil rights, the Jewish elite in Budapest rationalized that if they kept their heads down, they would emerge from the war relatively unscathed. Even after the Nazis arrived in 1944, and Hungary's Jews began to be herded into ghettos and deported, they stayed the course. Perhaps because, as, as Moncachi argues, they, quote, entertained the illusion that Hungary would be the exception, a tiny foothold of an island in the sea of Jewish devastation. Or perhaps because they felt they had no other option. To quote Ferenc Lazzo again, with greater temporal distance, it might be easier to acknowledge that members of the council made politically and morally problematic choices because there was no alternative. It was impossible for them to make good decisions. My father could never forgive himself for leaving his mother behind when he escaped in 1944. I should have done something to save her, he would say. But what could he have done? Shortly after the Germans occupied Hungary, my grandmother was arrested on the far-fetched charge that she was a threat to the Reich. My father, age 16, 
accompanied her to the Gestapo detention center on Rochsillard Street, carrying her brown leather valise. Assured by elder statesmen of the community that she would soon be released, my father would only later learn sorry, that she had been sent to Auschwitz and then forced into labor for the Nazis at a factory in Schapau, Germany. She survived the ordeal only to later commit suicide. Not surprisingly, my father empathized with his cousin Ernu's impossible dilemma. In the years that it's taken to bring this project to fruition, I've come to understand why my father adamantly insisted that Ernu Munkachi's How It Happened had to be translated and made available to a wide audience. This is a book that illuminates the agony and the moral weight of choiceless choices. It's a book of history, certainly, yet it feels particularly vital right now as Jews everywhere anxiously confront a surge of anti-Semitism, as bigotry and hatred have again become embedded in our everyday discourse. The Holocaust is fading from memory. Among Americans, two-thirds of millennials and 41% of all adults do not know what Auschwitz was according to a recent poll commissioned by the Conference on Jewish Material Claims Against Germany. It was Elie Wiesel himself, a survivor of Auschwitz and of the Holocaust in Hungary, who most eloquently implored that we remember the horrors of the past. For the survivor who chooses to testify, it is clear his duty is to bear witness to the dead and to the living, he wrote in the preface to the New English translation of his memoir, Night. To forget would be not only dangerous, but offensive. To forget the dead would be akin to killing them a second time. Thank you. <laughs>